I use footage from Farringdon all the time and it crops up in a lot of my videos, but I've never really done a video specifically talking about Farringdon. Let's do something about that, shall we? Farringdon is a station in the City of London. It's just around the corner from Smithfield Market and Hatton Garden. It's on the Metropolitan, Hammersmith and City and Circle lines, plus the Thameslink and the Elizabeth line. It's one of the oldest underground stations, having opened in 1863. But its story doesn't begin there. Actually, in a way, its story goes back to before the concept of the underground even existed. In the first half of the 19th century, the railways arrived. London's first passenger railway was the London and Greenwich, completed in 1836 and terminating opposite the financial district at London Bridge. Next came the London and Birmingham Railway at Euston in 1837. The Great Western Railway arrived in Paddington in 1838. In the 1840s, Britain enjoyed, or possibly suffered, from railway mania when hundreds of proposals for lines flooded into Parliament. The City of London was mostly safe from these. Land was expensive and controlled by powerful interests, so no one was able to venture further into the centre. But it was clear that that wouldn't last forever, and one of the proposals that reached Parliament was by Charles Pearson, the solicitor to the City of London. This was for a grand central station located at Farringdon in the heart of the city. This would serve several different railway companies. Pearson seems to have been that rare and cherishable thing, a politician who genuinely wanted to do good. His main stated aims were to enable workers in the city to move to the more salubrious suburbs and to reduce road traffic. The terminus would have been located roughly between City Thameslink and the present-day Farringdon. Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately given how everything turned out in the end, this Grand Central Terminus was rejected by the Royal Commission on Railway Termini. They decreed that no railways could be built within central London. Well, mostly, anyway. Pearson modified his concept. Instead of one grand central station where all the railways could meet, he proposed a railway that would connect the termini of the different companies together. It would run underground so as not to carve the city up as the commission had feared. A London Underground Railway if you will. Farringdon was still a part of this, though. Or, should I say, Victoria Street. That was the name originally intended for the station serving Farringdon. In the end, though, they chose the name Farringdon Street. This was, at least for the time being, intended to be the terminus of the new line. There was a rather hair-raising incident that took place during construction in 1862. The River Fleet runs alongside the station, more or less next to where the Thameslink platforms are. While digging the cutting, the workers accidentally broke into the fleet, causing the works to flood. Repairs were effected quite rapidly, and construction was completed by the end of the year. On the 10th of January 1863, Farringdon Street opened, along with the rest of the Metropolitan Railway. At Farringdon Street, a banquet was held to celebrate the opening of this wonderful new line. That being said, the station that opened in 1863 was not quite the same station we have today. It was very slightly east of the present station, built on the site of what had been Farringdon Market, and it was made of timber. Just two years later, the Metropolitan was extended to Moorgate, and the station was re-sited. I suspect, though I have no confirmation here, that the reason the original station was built from timber was because they knew early on they'd probably have to rebuild it. The new station was designed by John Fowler, the Metropolitan Railway's engineer. It originally looked very different. The Metropolitan was hugely successful, not only in its own right, but as a means for other railway companies to send their trains around the city. This was all a bit much for the railway's two tracks, so very early on they began work on what became known as the Widened Lines, an additional pair of tracks from King's Cross to Moorgate for the use of other companies. These opened on the 1st of March 1866, and along with them, Farringdon Street gained a second pair of platforms. At the same time, the London, Chatham and Dover Railway were building a line of their own from Herne Hill into the city, which connected with the Metropolitan at Farringdon. Naturally, the Chatham boys negotiated use of the new platforms. 
So too did the Great Northern Railway, who owned King's Cross and built a truly agonising curve from there to the widened lines. The Midland Railway began running trains through here in 1868. So while Farringdon wasn't the biggest or the most glamorous station in London, it was certainly important. There were also several goods depots nearby, including a set of sidings beneath Smithfield used by the Great Western Railway. So that's one more company to add to the many passing through Farringdon. Here's an image of the busy Victorian scene at Farringdon, as drawn by an artist who apparently used a toy train as reference material. In 1916, the Snow Hill Tunnel that connected Farringdon to the Herne Hill Line was closed to passengers, severing a very useful cross-London route. More on that later. On the 26th of January 1922, the station was renamed to Farringdon and High Hoban. In November of the following year, a new station building designed by C.W. Clark replaced the existing one, although there is still plenty of the original building to see. The white terracotta tiling is typical of the era. The interior used to look very different. It was originally decorated with green mosaic tiling like Aldgate, but this was removed during modernisation later on. While we're talking about features of the station, this parcels office sign is quite an interesting survivor. The Metropolitan, and indeed other underground lines, used to offer a parcels service on their trains. They'd have bicycle couriers to take the parcels on from the stations to their final destination. In 1936, the station was renamed to the more general Farringdon. In 1933, all the underground lines had been taken over by London Transport, so my guess is that they changed the name because they wanted to avoid confusion with Hoban Station on the Piccadilly and Central lines. The history of all the railway companies running through Farringdon is complicated. In 1923, the mainline companies, which for the purposes of this video is all the non-underground lines, were grouped together into four super companies. The Great Northern Railway became part of the London and North Eastern Railway, the Midland became part of the London, Midland and Scottish Railway, and the Great Western retained its identity. In 1948, they were all nationalised to form British Railways. British Railways was expected to turn a profit from an unprofitable network, and their way of doing this was modernisation, but also cutting back. It was only in the 1980s that they figured out that actually the way to get people to use your trains was to provide, well, good trains. The Thameslink project was a scheme to revive the Cross London Rail Link and maximise the potential of many of the commuter lines around the city. From 1990, Thameslink trains ran through Farringdon. In the 2000s, there were a few proposals to extend the Docklands Light Railway west. There were various versions suggested, but a couple of them would have included Farringdon. This never happened, sadly. Of course, the project everyone's talking about these days is the Elizabeth Line. This opened in 2022. Farringdon is on the central section, a brand new route beneath London. As part of this, two new entrances were constructed, one opposite the old Metropolitan Railway building and the other all the way over by Smithfield. The new platforms are long, so long, in fact, that you can also enter from Barbican, the next underground station to the east. The new entrances incorporate details in their architecture and decoration referencing the diamond trade on Hatton Garden and the brutalist design of the nearby Barbican estate. All things considered, I think Farringdon may have a lot more in store. Being an interchange between Thameslink and the Elizabeth Line, it means that a huge number of important destinations can be reached from here. Farringdon has never had the glamour or the cultural recognition of some of the bigger stations in London. It's not a St Pancras or a Waterloo. But I think that despite its age, its story still has a long way to go. Well, I hope you enjoyed this terracotta tiled tale from the tube. If you did, please do click the like button and consider subscribing for more. I'd like to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon for your continued support of this channel. You are the terracotta tiles to my frontage. And I'll see you all again very soon for another tale from the tube.